bringing together voices in child and youth healthcare. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, and the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. Welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, uh, the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today's webinar is titled Making Injury Data Accessible, Visually Pleasing and Useful. Can it be done? Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone back to what we often refer to as the start of our new webinar season, returning after a bit of a hiatus over the summer with a few sporadic presentations over the summer that you're always welcome to go back to and, and view on the Knowledge Exchange Network. But uh, we do take a bit of a hiatus, so this we're now back into our full uh, weekly schedule now going forward. Um, it's a, So it's a great opportunity to uh, welcome everyone back. And it's also uh, I'm also very excited to bring today's topic to our audience because it's always it's about injury prevention, which is, is, uh, is always of interest to our audience, but it's also about making data visually pleasing and useful, which is not an easy task. Everyone's always interested in data, but it's certainly not always visually pleasing and useful uh, all, the, all the time. So as I'm really interested in hearing what uh, our presenters have to say about this topic today. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce today's uh, panel. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome back uh, one, uh, the, one of our speakers uh, today, Dr. Allison McPherson. Uh, Allison's a professor in the School of Kinesiology and Health Science at York University and an adjunct scientist at the uh, Institute for Clinical Evalu Evaluative Sciences. She's, she's the co-principal investigator on the CHR team in child and youth injury prevention and holds a CHR chair in child health services and policy research. Uh, you may recall Allison's presentation, Built for Walking, Safe Environments and Active School Transport, uh, transportation, which we hosted uh, here on the CAFC Presents webinar series a few months back, and, and that presentation also available on the uh, Knowledge Exchange Network if you want to go back and take a look at that one. And uh, joining uh, Allison is Dr. Ian Pike, uh, who's the director of the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit, associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at UBC, co-lead of the Evidence to Innovation theme of BC Children's Hospital Research, and co-executive director and spokesperson for the Community Against Preventable Injuries. He's also the co-principal investigator of the CHR team in child and youth injury prevention. So uh, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Ian Pike. Over to you, Ian. Well, thank you very much. There we go. So Alison and I are going to share this uh, presentation. And thank you very much for your interest and attendance this morning, Alison. Uh, perhaps I'd ask you to begin, please. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you to CAFC and, and Doug and Ann and everybody for inviting us to do this presentation. We're going to talk about making injury data accessible, visually pleasing, and useful. Um, can it be done? We certainly think so, but I'll leave it up to you at the end. Uh, so, Ian, if you go to the first slide. Uh, the purpose go. of this presentation, first of all, to give everybody a little bit of background about our CIHR team in child and youth injury prevention, which uh, has completed its mandate but still continues to do presentations and share uh, what we've done over the five years of funding. We wanted to explain the process for developing the Atlas and Dashboard uh, because I think that that's part of the reason for its success is that we started very, very early on uh, in the grant process talking to people about what they'd like to see and how they'd like to to use the Atlas. We're going to go through a demonstration of the Atlas itself, which then anybody can go back to. And we can explain the type of data and the information that can be found here and work through some examples with you. 
Um, so starting with the team, when we first got together um, seven years ago to, vis to have a vision of the CIHR team, our vision was that child and youth injury prevention across Canada will be enhanced through partnerships among child and youth injury prevention researchers and committed end users and stakeholders, including CAFC, of course, but also including Parachute Canada and others. We wanted a research program based on the public health approach. And we wanted to address child and youth injury by developmental stages, going from very young children and infants to school-aged children and adolescents, to target relevant causes of injury within these groups, including the burden of injury, the risks and circumstances of injury among First Nations and Inuit children and youth particularly. So our goals, number one, was to strengthen child and youth injury surveillance research and prevention. And one thing that we found as we were conceptualizing this team was that people were saying, we need data, we need data, we need data. We don't have any information about the burden of injury. We don't know how to persuade people that injury is such an important topic. And what we discovered was we have data, it's just not accessible to people. So that was one major goal was to make the surveillance and data uh, accessible. We wanted to engage people who were going to use our research and stakeholders at all appropriate stages of planning and execution of the uh, injury prevention program. And we also had a, a really strong focus on delivering training and mentorship uh, for trainees and new investigators. And we also wanted to foster excellence in communication and encourage engagement of everybody in injury prevention through the development of the uh, injury prevention web portal, the Atlas, and the dashboard. So our research outcomes that we were hoping for and I think we achieved were a really enhanced understanding of the burden of child and youth injury in Canada, investigation into pediatric trauma systems, which we're not really going to touch on today, but we've done some amazing work in that field, access to First Nations child and youth injury data, and evidence related to risks and potential strategies to reduce the burden of injury in Canada. So this is our team a diagram, and I won't go through and name everybody, but I think uh, it's important to note that one of the reasons we had such a successful team was we had a very strong executive committee. We had international expert advisors who gave us advice at the beginning of the grant, halfway through the grant, and then at the end of the grant. Uh, we had some fantastic injury researchers from across the country, and um, we had a, a wonderful project coordinator, Shannon Pete. And then we had over 60 total trainees, many of whom have gone on either to um, professional jobs or jobs in academia, and we're very, very proud of our, our training record. And finally, we had our end user team members from Parachute Canada, the Canadian Institute of Child Health, and others, and we still are in touch, and I think it's important to note at the bottom, but not not, last but not least, Elaine Orbein, who's always been a champion of uh, injury prevention in Canada. This map shows our team, how we conceptualized it at the beginning. And you can see we had people doing high-risk population studies. We had Aboriginal children and youth, burden of injury, pediatric trauma systems, novel research approaches, and training and capacity building. But what's really important is at the center of all that, we had a vision of a web portal that would have a dashboard, an injury atlas, and places where we could communicate all of our research findings and have people able to comment and give us feedback on those. And we did uh, an end of grant report, which we're also very proud of, and we would be happy to share. It's also available on the website that documents all the things that our team achieved. And I think some of the highlights are on the next slide. Uh, so over the five years, our team had 143 publications related to the team grant. We uh, had over 60 trainees. We leveraged, on top of the um, $4 million that CIHR funded us, we leveraged another $8.6 million in grant funds. We had a, more than 160 interviews and press conferences translating the, the results of our research. Uh, we have built relationships with 27 key knowledge users from government and non-governmental organizations across Canada. And we provided 185 presentations to stakeholder groups, national and international conferences. And that number actually would go up now because we're all going to the international meeting in Finland to present more of our research. 
So the main focus now of this presentation is the Injury Indicators dash Dashboard right at the center. And the purpose is to foster excellence in communication, as I mentioned earlier. So to develop this, we included, we had three partner stakeholder meetings and four end user meetings associated with national and regional conferences. And we had two meetings with data stewards, including the Canadian uh, Institute of Health Information, Statistics Canada, et cetera. And uh, we got agreements to share data to populate the dashboard. And then we were so fortunate to have a PhD student in visual analytics, and she jumped on board with us and decided to take this on as a project to develop a BC injury dashboard as a proof of concept. And she did it a very, very rigorous process, including interviewing people and talking to end users, talking to researchers. Um, she just did a fantastic job. Uh, this, we developed our target audience which first and foremost is practitioners. So public health nurses, anybody who works in the field and wants to know more about what data on injury prevention is available. Uh, for researchers as well, to provide justification for their research projects. And decision makers, um, such as policymakers, ministries of health, anybody who might be interested in understanding the profile of injury in their province. So we've been really, really lucky to get mortality data from Statistics Canada, hospitalization data from the Canadian Institute of Health Information, drowning data from the Drowning Prevention Research Centre of Canada, transport data from each individual province, which includes motor vehicle collisions and lots of information around those circumstances, and sports and recreation data, which is derived as a subset from the uh, Kai High hospitalization. So when we talked to people, they had some identified features that they wanted to see. They wanted a very clear landing page, and they wanted a mortality clock. So that's kind of the social math. How many people today have died in Canada as a result of an injury? And uh, of course, we can't actually capture the people as they, as they actually die, but we can use based on trends, and Ian will show you that. Uh, there were three main components linked through a dashboard style interface. There's Tableau visualizations, which are associated with the indicators page, and Ian will show you all of these, so I won't go into too much detail. There's indicators pages with narrative content, and uh, 34 injury indicators uh, condensed to 10, which are available. And then there's the IDOT, which shows data tables and dynamic graphing, so that if somebody says, oh, I want a graph of the number of motor vehicle collision deaths in Canada, they can get that quite easily. Uh, we can do a site-wide search for terms. Uh, we highlight the research of our team, so any research projects we've done, publications, presentations, etc. And we have a share and export functionality. So of course, being health data, it has to be highly confidential, but we can export the data if we have cell sizes big enough and they show. And so somebody could take that data, say you wanted to use it to make a presentation, you can export the data in either table form or in graphic form. Uh, so this is an example of the landing page, and uh, I think it's really important to thank Parachute Canada, who have just agreed to take this dashboard over and keep it on the Parachute website, because as Canada's National Injury Prevention Organization, it's a really natural host for this. And you can see there's three elements uh, with the three um, squares on the bottom, the Injury Data Dashboard, Injury Research Insights, and then the Injury Data Online Tool. And um, there's a um, three videos, introductory videos for each of them. So we're not going to show you those because then you wouldn't have to listen to the presentation. But if you went to the website, you could look at the, the tool for the uh, iDOT, the iVisualization, and the Atlas. And also available on the website is a general uh, video that is an introduction to injuryevidence.ca and tells you how you can navigate through the site and some key findings. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ian, and he's going to take you to the website and uh, show you some of the features. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Alison. Um, as you saw in the static graphic, this is the landing page 
of the um, website and atlas. And again, to echo Alison's comments regarding Parachute, they have been a, a partner in this team since its outset, and we're very grateful that they've continued to sustain um, the website, and will do so out into the future. Of course, with our involvement on the data side of things and the research side of things, but the NGO Parachute seemed to be the very natural person, or group rather, to take this on. Um, to begin with, as Alison also mentioned, under the help feature, if you click this button um, at the far left of the screen, um, you can listen to any of the videos that are available to um, navigate the website. But as Alison said, I'll be doing that in person this morning. So to start, um, the home page contains three or four active buttons, um, the landing page with a scrolling video of uh, highlights the, of recent research and um, injury prevention information, and then the three active sites, which all have included menus that I'm going to walk through in a little while. The menu um, allows you to access any of those three components through uh, float over menus, which you can click on to access. It also includes a um, resource access to the resource library, frequency, frequently asked questions, who to contact about, and the terms and conditions under which this website operates in terms of the data. As Alison mentioned, um, people asked for the ability to search and people asked for an injury clock. So in terms of the search function, let's use the example of playground. So if I type in the word playground, if I could spell it correctly, there we go, and search. And because I'm running wireless, it's going just a little slower than normally, but what will happen now is all of the information that's contained on the website that's related to that term, playground, our research, uh, data related to playground injuries, and those resources that exist in the resource library. So returning to the home page by clicking on the um, Injury Prevention Atlas logo. The next feature was the injury clock that users wanted to have displayed. And so when you click on this, the clock spins to the current date. And so you can see that uh, they have the clocks have spun around to just past September here and include the projected number of deaths to date for 2016 for children and youth and the project projected number of hospitalizations for children and youth based upon trend data over the previous five years. But we know that injury trends from year to year don't change dramatically, and so this injury clock um, is fairly representative of the average uh, burden of injury, both death and hospitalizations among children and youth in Canada. The third button was, uh, is a space for us to um, develop and include interesting visualizations of data and where possible to use that data dynamically. So I'm going to launch this um, visualization of potential years of life lost due to injury among children and youth. And so an algorithm was used here to develop this um, visualization which shows the story of child deaths in Canada. A male 15 to 19 dying because of an accident, a male 10 to 14 dying, a zero to four year old. So as these lines progress across the image, each line represents one death, that occurred in the years 2006, 2007, 2008, 
2009 and right up to 2011. The orange is an indication of how long that child or youth lived. The white is an indication of the potential years of life lost or the years stolen, as we've called it. You can see that any one of these lines has a narrative and you can float the cursor over that to understand a little more about each life that was lost and the potential that was lost to injury uh, in this country. There are, are a number of filters that you can utilize to filter by sex, by age group, by cause of death. So if you were interested in poisoning related deaths, you could click on this and what happens is the, the visualization changes such that the poisoning deaths re remain on the upper and the other remain below. And then, of course, you can filter through by year and by sex as well. So this was a, an important um, demonstration of how our visualizations can be used to present an interesting view of data, and we plan on creating more dynamic visualizations to add to this atlas over time. So included on the atlas is a searchable resource library and I can just demonstrate there that the resource library includes all of these different categories which are the basic indicators around which the whole website has been built and you will see examples of all of the properties that are within the um, resource library, whether they are presentations, whether they are publications, and you can scroll through the pages. If you like those particular, if you'd like to have one of those, you are able to email this information, you're able to get the full citation for inclusion in a reference list, for example, and you could go directly to the source of that particular publication to um, see the original article uh, because most of the articles are um, open access and so we are able to include them as well on the website. So returning back to the home page, we'll explore the three areas and I'm going to start with the dashboard area. Um, this dashboard used Tableau software which was programmed by our PhD student in visual analytics and the views that are included on the dashboard are those that were indicated by our end users to be the important views that they wanted to have as an ongoing basis. It includes injury death data, injury hospitalizations, motor vehicle related data, uh, injuries, sport related drowning, poisoning, and we've included some economic burden data as well. So we can just explore a few features. Again, there is how to use this tool. So if you click on this button, you, the video tutorial will pop up. Um, and we then have the option, let's for example, click on the de drowning data set. And what will display is the drowning data set dashboard. And so the dashboards typically start with a display of the data which is mapped and displays the rates per 100,000 of child and youth deaths across the country. Um, data again from the Drowning Research Center which is actually data gleaned from the coroner's data set. Um, they glean every year um, drowning deaths and are able to share that information with us. The second visualization that was asked for is the injury caused by age group and sex over the years. And you can see here males to females and as you roll over information is given to you about the age group and the cause of death. Um, the, type, the drowning rates by activity type, so whether the in individual was involved in an aquatic activity, non 
boating, whether they were land ice or air transportation, or whether in fact they were bathing. And of course, this is a significant problem for the very young. And finally, drowning rates by location and age group. So whether the drowning occurred on a lake or a pond, moving water pool, bathing, etc. All of these charts can be filtered and to the right hand side you can select filters and the charts change dynamically to, um, to display the, the, the data that you're looking for uh, by filter. So we could work through a quick example so if we select injury hospitalizations on the data visualizations tool, we see again displays here, um, and these will represent hospitalizations from all injury causes. But we're going to um, do a few filters here. So if we uncheck our filters, and we're interested, for example, in just five to nine-year-olds, the five to nine year old data comes up and, and if we want to filter on cause of injury and for example select falls, now we see visualizations of five to nine year olds uh, falls. So figure one gives us the sort of national comparisons for uh, five to nine year old falls in Canada. Um, we see some trend data um, by fiscal year, we see hospitalization by cause and subcause. So now we start to see how the falls break down in terms of the cause of injury among the five to nine year olds for hospitalization rates. Um, we can see the gender comparison here. And there is a moving table uh, at the bottom that shows us the um, provincial and health region breakdown. So if someone is particularly interested in uh, specific health region comparisons, the data exists to the extent uh, that it's available from each of the provinces. So that's the visualization dashboard. As I said, it includes um, the map, comparisons by age and sex, and then by cause of injury and by province. The same data also populates the injury data online tool. And the tool can be used to generate um, customized views of the data. So if we want to look again at injury hospitalizations, we would choose the injury hospitalization tool from the IDOT. And like when the tool appears, like all of the tools, there are six main tabs that appear with a number of drop-down menus that I'll walk through. So there is the data selection tab, which we're currently in. There is a tab that will produce data table, a tab for the graph that's produced. There is information about the data that's available as a glossary in terms of how age-specific rates are calculated, what standardized rates are, what the ICD coding is that's included in the cause of injury. We describe the methods that we've used in terms of calculation of rates. And of course, like most things, we have to give a disclaimer in terms of the user's responsibility for interpreting the data. So we could walk through an example here. So we want to look at a, a, an example of hospitalization. We're going to leave region and year as they are. Um, and then we're going to come and select region and year. So we could have selected health region or region for any of the provinces. Um, and we'll leave that to demonstrate how the data flows. We can select on demographics, and we can either select as an age group or by sex, and we'll leave all ages and both sexes. We can choose a specific cause of injury, and 
by selecting the plus mark under intent, we're able to filter on whether this is unintentional injury, intentional, other external causes, those that are undetermined in terms of the coding, and Medicare complications. If we select leading causes, and then we're able to look at the external causes of injury within each of those categories, unintentional, intentional, other, and undetermined. So you can drill down into this data very deeply. And if we look at sub-causes for unintentional injury and transport related, for example, you can now select motor vehicle modal. So the data is very flexible in terms of how far you can drill down. I'm going to leave us on leading causes, and I'm going to uh, look at transport-related injuries. So we'll unselect these and select transport-related injuries. And we'll also be able to look at the type of injury, and there are all of the types of injury included. We can select on main body parts injured, and we can look at the place of occurrence. So let's look at transport-related injuries that resulted in uh, fractures, dislocations, brain strains, and a crushing injury, for example. Then we will ask our data to be output as either a number of hospitalizations as a rate or an eight standardized rate. We'll just leave it simply as a number of hospitalizations. We can gather further information on the hospitalizations by asking what was the total length of stay, average total length of stay, for all of those injuries. And using the um, cost data, we can also ask for the total cost. We're going to look at that data by age group, and we've only selected it by, by the various age groups, and we won't cross tab. So we will submit that. And so the, the query that we entered is being synthesized. And again, because of the wireless, it's running a little slowly. Uh, but what ends up coming out is a confirmation of our query inquiry. So we can double check that what we are looking at in the table is, in fact, what we wanted to um, achieve. And I apologize, I said transport-related injuries. I forgot to uncheck the intentional and others. The example is still true uh, for those injuries. Um, and we get a resulting table broken down by age group, as we did, or requested, the number of hospitalizations for each of those age groups for each of these causes of injury. We can look at the total length of stay and the total uh, costs associated with those injuries. We're also able to see this information as a chart or a graph rather and in this case it's a simple histogram uh, by age group in terms of the number of hospitalizations. Now this information um, can be exported. We'll go back to the table. This information can be exported as Excel as, uh, into a Word document or as a simple text file by selecting which format and by pressing the export button. So that's how the injury data online tool works for you to, to do customized um, queries of the data. There are, there are a couple of icons exist over here and as we've selected the data in the IDOT, if we click this icon, it takes us over to the dashboard, and the dashboard will be displaying the same data that we had selected for the IDOT. So there's a dynamic nature between the IDOT and the IVIS that can be utilized backwards and forwards if you wanted to look at uh, how the data would present visually using the dashboard. 
And this little question mark, if you get lost, is how to launch the explanatory uh, video in terms of finding your way around the atlas. Going back to the home page, the final section of the um, tool is the atlas with information. And earlier in Alison's presentation, she talked about 34 indicators being reduced to 10. Previous to the CIHR team in injury uh, child and youth injury prevention, Alison and I were co-PIs on a team to develop injury in indicators. And the resultant publication was 34 injury indicators for children and youth in Canada. It became a very complex task to try and include all of those indicators on this particular atlas. And so some were grouped and pooled. And the resulting 10 indicators, and this was done in consultation with our users, with our partners and other researchers, and the resulting indicators are here, listed as 10. So an example here, um, let's take a look at sport-related injury, which has been abstracted from the Kaihai data. On all of our sections, it begins with why are sport-related injuries an important indicator to child and youth-related injury? How can this indicator be used in terms of our understanding? Key terms related to that particular indicator. And then the research that was conducted by this child and youth team that made a contribution to our understanding in terms of sport and recreation-related injury prevention. Um, that in, in this case, we did work on ski and snowboard-related injuries, helmet use, and these, these work re re resulted in some significant changes in policy. In Nova Scotia, for example, where um, ski helmet legislation was passed at ski resorts in that province. Um, it also worked on snowboard terrain features, and that research resulted in uh, policies being adopted throughout the province of Quebec that um, ensured the safe design of um, terrain parks in that province. And that work continues uh, advocating for safe design across the country. Um, the work of Dr. Shalina Bobo, one of our researchers, um, included work on concussions. And the Concussion Awareness Training Tool is a separate website that can be accessed either from here or directly. And then other resources related to our research and research that's been conducted uh, by our partners and others in Canada that's important to understanding the prevention of child and youth related injury in this province. Uh, sorry, in this country. And as I said earlier, all of that information is available by searching the central section, the Injury Research Insights, which is the Atlas section, or again, through search of the resource library. So that's the, the quick tour. I'm going to leave it there because I think these kinds of websites are much more easily explored on your own. And, and the fact that there are um, very helpful explanatory videos associated with this website at the help button, which appears on the home page. Um, I'm going to leave our presentation there, but welcome your feedback. There is an opportunity to provide feedback on this website through the feedback link on the left. Clicking on it leads to a um, input screen uh, where we are pleased to receive your feedback on the website because we are going to be uh, iteratively improving and adding to as time goes on. So, Alison, is there anything further that you wish to add? Um, and if not, perhaps we would uh, entertain questions. I think we should move to questions. Thanks, Ian.
All right. Well, thank you very much. Great presentation. That is really a fantastic website that certainly made uh, the, 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 the data visually pleasing for sure. That was, there's some great visualizations in there. That, that was really excellent. Um, so, yes, as, uh, as uh, they said, uh, they are welcoming your questions. So please uh, type a question into the question box or a comment if you, uh, if you have any questions or anything for our presenters, and we'll certainly present them uh, to the presenters. Uh, the first question that came in was related to when you were demonstrating the data visualizations about, uh, I believe it was the, I think you referred to it as the years of life stolen, and you indicated that the um, the, the lines that were going across were, were more or less in individual cases. The, the orange colored line was was how long they had lived, and then the white portion being how long they had, the, the number of, of years that, that were stolen, more or less. Um, each case was not just sort of running out to an, to an average lifespan of 70-some of years old. Each case was sort of ending at a different point in time, uh, like a, a different number of years stolen. I was, they, were, they were wondering how you calculated for each case what the expected what the, what the life expectancy would have been for, for each of those cases in, in order for them to each be different. Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, I don't have all of the detail in front of me, but there is an alg there's an algorithm that we developed and used based upon average lifespan and the variation around the lifespan. So if you think of an average um, value that might be extended to, there's variance on either side of that value. And then the, um, the algorithm randomly assigns um, the end, the predicted end age based within that variation. Um, the, the detail of which is available through research conducted in the United States and there is, there's a reference included on that visualization um, and we work with our biostatisticians to verify how that uh, was undertaken within uh, the Canadian data. And um, I can provide more detail when I'm back at my office, but essentially it's using the range of predicted values based upon the age at death. It's not taking sort of comorbidities or anything else related to the individual cases that would have affected lifespan. It, it was based on an, on, a, on an algorithm, as you were saying? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, came in from Linda. She says, great website. She says, do you have a plan to have data for adults, and do you have mental health data that may be responsible for some of the suicides or suicide attempts? Do you, do you have the mental health data, data that would be associated with those, and, and do you have any plans to extend this to include adult injury data or a different website, perhaps, for adult injury data? Um. We have talked often about extending this to include adult data. Um, the component, which is the IDOT, the, the component which allows you to query the data to produce uh, tables and charts, exists in British Columbia for the provincial data there where we do have data across the lifespan. So the development work in terms of a pilot one prov province is already done in British Columbia. We could extend it to include the national data, but as you might understand, there's a considerable amount of work to be done in terms of gathering the data, cleaning and preparing it in terms of the, the lockup format that's required behind this atlas. It is something that we wish to do in the future, but it does require somebody to uh, fund our proposal to do that. Uh, to the question as to whether we have mental health data, um, we do not have mental health data at this point. Allison and I are currently in discussion with um, other partners, in, including the Child Welfare League of Canada, to develop a much larger proposal that would uh, start to look at both unintentional and intentional injury prevention for children and youth in the in the country and we would certainly hope to um, include mental health partners and other appropriate partners in that work to end up with some kind of um, portal like this is is that fair to say Alison yes that's we're hoping to do that 
I think in part because we recognize that um, the, I think the historical distinction between intentional and unintentional injuries is a little bit false, that in fact many of the risk factors and uh, many of the vulnerabilities you know, arise from the same root causes upstream. So we think that it does make a stronger case uh, for all of us to put uh, unintentional and intentional injury together. Next uh, question that came in was was about your your definitions of in, or how you define unintentional versus intentional, or how, or how you categorize the different injuries uh, into those categories. Where's what's the root of that process for? Like how how does how do you develop that the, the the distinction in the data between intentional and unintentional? Do you want me to tackle that one again? Yeah. 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 So the um, the International Classification of Disease, the ICD-10, codes all um, hospitalizations and deaths in a standardized way around the world. So arising from the medical chart or the coroner's report, they categorize the data and they code it um, based on the ICD-10. So one of the codes in the ICD-10 indicates whether it was considered to be intentional, unintentional, or of undetermined intent. So that's just from the, the medical chart and the coding in the ICD-10. There is some, some people say that for sure the injuries of undetermined intent and intentional injuries are undercounted uh, because if they're not sure, they often just leave it as unintentional. All right. And I would add just that um, the specific listing of each of those ICD-10 codes that been ascribed to any of our indicators is listed in the glossary for each of those indicators. So a person can go and see which ICD-10 codes we have included or not included. And those are based on um, classifications from the International Collaborative Effort on Injury Statistics. So they have this matrix where they say this is these codes are associated with this type of injury. Mm -hmm. All right, Glenn is uh, looking at the IDOT, and he's wondering if there is a way to see yearly rates. If you wouldn't mind maybe just flipping over to the IDOT for us and, and showing him that. So for in, the, in the hospitalizations, and I can just leave everything there, the yearly rates would be broken down by age group and by year. And then that's going to give you, if you submit that, one of the things that our users asked for, and I'm not demonstrating it very well because of my slow wireless at home, unfortunately, but one of the things that users asked for was that this not take a long time after the query. And when we use this at, at our university institutions, it's almost instantaneous that the charts and the tables are produced. And please check that out when you um, use it at your institution. But now that we've selected, you can see by age group and year, age group and year, age group and year. So you can see the yearly number of hospitalizations in this case. Uh, if we wanted to uh, have rates, we can go back to the data selection. It preserves everything we've had, but instead of number, we want rate. We submit that. And the table now will show me the age groups, by age group, by year, um, and the age-specific rates. It also preserves the number. It also gives you the, host, uh, the population numbers in each of those uh, so that you can see how the rate was calculated. Does that answer the question for Ben? He wrote a comment back that says he's got it now, so, and thanks. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. thanks. so thank you very much for that. Uh, if uh, Just uh, one more call for the to the audience for if there are any more questions. We did, a, we did a survey on our webinars a while ago, and people were asking if we could shorten our webinars to an hour, although they were really uh, interesting webinars that would go on for an hour and a half. They did ask us to shorten them to an hour, so we do have about uh, five minutes left before we're, our, our scheduled close time. So uh, if, if you do have another question, um, please do type it in uh, quickly, and we'll get to maybe one more question before we wrap up. We did have some questions come in earlier about uh, 
has anyone used this data for advocacy purposes and the such? And, and then you, sub you proceeded to sort of demonstrate uh, on the website uh, some of your examples of how the data has been used. So, so that's, uh, that was great to see that people have actually, in fact, used it in the wild for, for advocacy purposes and research, research purposes, et cetera. So that's great to see. Um, Annie just put in a, a, a question saying, is there a plan for translating the site, I'm assuming, to other, other languages, French or, or other languages? We, we currently do not have a plan, uh, pure, and that's only purely based upon um, funding that we don't that we don't have for translation. Um, it's it, it's a very difficult task, or at least has been for us, to try and find a source of fund, funding to translate this site uh, into French or any other language. Although we would love to. And you also will notice to. that in many cases we're missing data from Quebec, and we would love to populate that data too. All right, so we don't I, see I, any more questions. I, Sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to add to the previous comment about advocacy. I think one of the most striking um, pieces of work that was done uh, was by Dr. Carolyn Emery and Dr. Alison McPherson and others related to... Uh, hockey and the research that was done within this team and others that uh, looked at the burden of injury as a consequence of checking in um, youth hockey resulted in policy changes such that they removed uh, checking from the peewee level of hockey. Firstly in um, the province of Alberta and subsequently Hockey Canada has made that ruling at the younger age group. So I think the research, when the evidence is there to demonstrate the, the importance of changes in policy and changes in practice, it can happen. And we're very pleased that uh, our work has led to some of these types of changes. All right. Well, I can give you my personal thanks, uh, Allison, as my son, my older son is now entering minor Pee Wee this year, so uh, he doesn't have to deal with the body checking for another couple of years. So I do appreciate that. Um, so that's all we have for questions. Maybe we'll just give you, uh, the both of you a chance to uh, give us your thoughts on just some closing comments or key messages or or where you where you see this going. What do you see as the next steps or the future for this or or you know the next opportunity? If uh, maybe we can start with uh, with you, Allison. Well, um, well. first of all, thank you so much, Doug, for having us present it. I really hope that uh, everybody on the call who has anything to do with injury and advocacy uses this. Uh, use it in, I plan to use it in my statistics class to show people how uh, you can take data and tell a story. And um, I think the next steps are to keep going forward with this, to, uh, to work with Parachute and help them keep it up to date uh, in terms of the research that we do and... Uh, and yeah, just trying to continue on with the advocacy and policy changes and um, helping everybody to understand that injury isn't just a natural consequence of being alive, that it is a, a serious public health problem for our children and youth and we can do something about it. Ian? Yeah, I, I would concur. I think we've started this process. Um, this was sort of the product that we wanted to come out of our team and, and so we're very pleased to have built it and that it functions as well as it does. For me, um, the continuation of this site and keeping it relevant, up to date and meaningful to the users is sort of the priority. We would like to extend the site to all ages and we would like to involve more data partners where other relevant data to injury uh, can be included. We know that there's a whole bunch of socio-demographic data that would be helpful to further understand the relationship to injury. SES and some of those kinds of things. There are, there are, there are data available from previous surveys, like the Canadian Community Health Survey, that would be interesting to include on this atlas and to see uh, in relation to hospital or deaths and so on. And so uh, the earlier comment about mental health data, um, we've always so thought that justice data would be very interesting to include as well. And certainly um, some of the insurance-related data 
would be in, important to include, particularly if this is extended on to the adult population. And so it's to continue to keep it relevant, alive, and um, moving forward. And we would welcome input um, from people in terms of their wants and wishes for the site, as well as ideas for cool visualizations, because we've got a couple of very cool students who are um, willing to respond to those kinds of challenges and uh, would welcome um, those kinds of suggestions as well. All right, thank you very much. And the best place to give give that feedback, is that through the feedback little tab on, on the website? Is that the best way to sort of uh, uh, make those requests for data visualizations or, or, or provide feedback? Is that the best place? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. I mean, again, a fantastic presentation. Really, the, the title said it all. Like, you know, can you make data useful and, and visually pleasing? I mean, you certainly did. You have proven that it is possible. So I hope uh, uh, we had a comment come in that saying that your work is inspiring, and I, 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 I totally agree. I mean, to, it, it is inspiring to see people take data and make it so useful and visually appealing. So that, what a great job. So uh, on behalf of the audience and, and us at CAFC here, thank you for such a great presentation. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity and your interest. We really appreciate it. All right. Uh, so we'll wrap this webinar, uh, today's webinar up. Uh, we do our webina webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And as I mentioned, we have shortened them down to 60 minutes, uh, which is still giving us a good opportunity to, to hear a great presentation and, some, and lots of time to have some great questions. Uh, and when you watch live, you, that is, does provide you with the opportunity to uh, ask your questions and provide your comments, and, which really enrich the discussion. But when you can't watch live, we do record all of these sessions and make them available after the fact. In case you missed a piece or want to share it with your colleagues, you can find those on the Knowledge Exchange Network at www.can.cafc.org. Uh, our next webinar will be on September 14th next week uh, and will be titled Pediatric Sepsis, the Importance of Data as a Foundation for Improvement, continuing on with our data theme. Uh, on the heels of World Sepsis Day, uh, we'll be welcoming Dr. Melissa Parker and Jane Stewart Minaret to reflect on what improvements we have seen in outcomes for pediatric sepsis data. Uh, many Canadian hospitals serving the pediatric population have signed the World Sepsis Day Declaration and have committed to to raising awareness, education, and improving recognition and management of sepsis, and accurate data is required for any quality improvement process. So we encourage you, uh, prior to that webinar, to check out any inf all the information on CAFC's, uh, from CAFC's sepsis community of practice, which you can find on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, there's the sepsis screening tool and lots of other uh, interesting information on sepsis there. And then following that session on September 21st, we'll be welcoming our colleagues uh, from the CYCC Network, that's the Children and Youth in Challenging Context Network, to talk about about supporting young refugees through school-based solutions. And this webinar will look at school-based initiatives to support mental health and successful resettlement of young uh, refugees and newcomers and support their uh, mental health and well and health, mental health and well-being. Um, so that'll be a great, se a great session uh, to welcome and a great opportunity to welcome the, our colleagues from the CYCC back. So as always, some great stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope to see you back here next week. Bye everyone. Mm -hmm.